Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Sabbath day and another day of life. And Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would guide our minds and that you would uh, take control. Lead us out, Lord. Um, Hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, tonight, no, no, that's good. Is that new? That's new. No? I thought there was another one that was there before. Okay, all right. All right. Today, we're going to talk about something that uh, there's much interest over. And what we're going to do is this presentation is on the little horn. The little horn. So um, let's turn to Daniel, to Daniel chapter 8. Excuse me, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And this is going to be a a presentation that's um, where, where you guys participate. Interactive. Interactive, that's right. Daniel chapter 7, we're going to reason together, and what we're going to do is, um, and, and we have limited amount of time, so most all of us have read Daniel chapter 7, and if you haven't read Daniel chapter 7, then you can go back and you can, um, you can freshen up with that. So what happens in Daniel chapter 7, remember... Um, in verse 1, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And in this vision, you know, this is the one where Daniel sees these beasts, right? And uh, the first beast is a lion. Uh, What's the second beast? A bear, a bear with three ribs in its mouth. And the fourth beast is what? A leopard with four wings, right? Third beast, and the fourth beast is the nondescript beast, right? And um, now what happens is, um, let's look, we're, we're going to look at, the, at the, uh, the fourth beast, which is in verse 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. And after this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had what? It it had ten horns. Now, um, what happens here is this. The characteristics of this beast is, what's the characteristics of the metal? It's iron. It's got iron teeth, right? And this goes along with the image uh, in Daniel chapter 2, where he sees legs of what? Iron. Iron. So let's just do some little things here. And we've got how many horns? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten horns, right? We have ten horns. This beast has ten horns. And we're going to jump over, for time's sake, to the interpretation of the vision. And that's going to be in verse 15. Verse 15 says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. That's important. Okay? Remember, he's going to ask for what? He wants to know the truth. Mm-hmm. 
That will come in later, majorly important. So let me ask you a question. When, when the angel says, um, I'm come to, he says, he asked him the truth. Daniel is asking what when he says this? He's seen these, this figurative vision of all these beasts. He knows it means something. Just like when Nebuchadnezzar saw this image, he was troubled too. Because he's like, I don't know what it means, and I want to know the meaning of it. And when he goes to this messenger and says, I want to know the truth, what's he asking? What does he want to know? What it means, right? That's what he's saying. I want to know not what it means figuratively, but what it literally means. What's all this literally means? I want to know the truth. Verse 16, let's read it again. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. This is important. We're going to visit this later. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the what? Things. So the word truth means that now you know what? The interpretation of the things. It's interpreted. And here is what it is. These great beasts, which are four, are four what? Kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Why? Because it's different. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and nails were of brass, and devoured and break pieces and stamp the residue. So this beast not only is, has a representation of iron, but iron and what? And brass, it says. Iron and brass. And of the ten horns, which were in his head, and the, other, uh, and the other which came up before whom three fell. So what we're going to do is, we're going to go back to verse 8. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another, what? Little horn. Little horn. before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So, as we know from history, this, these ten horns that come up out of the forest kingdom are the divided part of the Roman Empire. Okay? The ten kingdoms... So we're going to call this the Ten Kingdoms. Okay? So these are the Ten Kingdoms, the Ten Divisions of the Roman Empire. And as he's considering these Ten Kingdoms, what happens? And how do we know that these are Ten Kingdoms? Verse 20. Verse 20, look at this. And the ten horns which were in his head, and of the other one, the other which came up before three fell, even the horn that had eyes and a mouth speaking very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And I beheld the same horn made war on, horn made war on the saints and prevailed against them. So what are these horns? What are they? They're kingdoms, right? So these are these ten kingdoms. Now, verse 24 says it directly. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Right? So there's this fourth beast. The fourth, be fourth beast has ten horns. This is all. We, we most of us know this, right? But then comes this little horn, right? And that's, that's what we're talking about tonight. The little horn.
So this little horn, and I'm going to color this little horn here black. Okay? And you know what? You're right, brother. I, it wouldn't be complete for me to do a drawing without his eyes and a mouth. Okay? There he is. He's a little horn. Okay, you're right. I should have done that. But I wanted to separate him from the 10. So now here's the question I ask you. The little horn comes up among them. That's what we're told, right? And it says... Uh, that he comes up among them. So what does that mean? So if these kingdoms represent the division of the beast, this beast, this fourth beast in the fourth kingdom is Rome, right? So you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then out of that beast comes these ten kingdoms, which also is represented by the ten toes, right, in the image, then to, for this beast or this horn to come up among the ten, what is that telling us? It has to come up in Europe. It has to come up in the area of what we know was the Roman Empire, right? Isn't that true? Okay. So... This is important. So we've established, and we're all in agreement with this, that this little horn, one of his identifying characteristics is he comes up among the ten. Right. Can I get an amen? amen? Awesome. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. We've established this. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel has another vision. And these, this vision now has to do with these other beasts, okay? And let's look at them. There's a different king, or is there? In the third year of the reign of Belteshar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto, unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And when I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan, in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli, then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had how many horns? Two horns. And... The two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. So we found out before that a horn represents a kingdom, right? So there's this beast, and it has these two horns, representing it's made up of two kingdoms. I saw the ram pushing what direction? Westward, westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him, neither there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So, let's just do this. We're going to have north, south, east, and west. That spells news, right? So this beast goes northward and westward and southward. Isn't that what it says? Maybe not in that order, but let's look at it again. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward. So... What direction is he coming from? 
the screwdriver for itself, it's got to be coming from the opposite. Right. That's the ram. Okay. And as I consider, behold, an he goat came from the west. west. Okay. So the goat Notice the word he. The he goat. The capitalized or Huh? The capitalized or lowercase. Let's see here. It is Okay, that's fine. The he goat. And what direction does he come from? West. So he comes from the west. Okay? And what does he do? Um The he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth. So he's on the face of the whole earth, touch not the ground. And the he goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So just one king. And I saw him come close under the, unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him and smote the ram and break his two horns. So he takes out these two kingdoms. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. And he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So let's do this. He comes across to the whole face of the whole earth. That's what it says. He comes against this ram from the west. Okay? So what happens here is, then what we do is, let's erase this. And it says that now this becomes one horn. Right? It becomes this one notable horn. And when he's great, what happens to it? It becomes broken, right? Mm -hmm. And then what comes up? Four horns. Four horns. So let's do this. One. Two. Three. Four. Right? Now, when this one horn is broken, who is this one horn? And you know, we don't have to guess at this. We don't have to guess of it. Because not only is it, not, not only is it uh, the third kingdom, but the Bible tells us that this horn is, Alexander the, uh, is, is Greece. Did you know that? Check this out. Turn with me. Before we do that, though, I want to show you something while we're still here. Let's repeat verse 9 again. And out of one of them came... Okay, let, let's, let's go to verse 8 again. Okay, then we'll go to 9. Verse 8. Therefore the he goat waxed very great... And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable horns, four notable ones, toward the four winds of heaven. So if, if, if this is Greece, and we're asking if, okay, if this is the Greek empire under Alexander the Great, and his empire is broken up, where are these four horns located? If, if these ten horns right here are the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, what are these four horns represented of, ten divi four divisions of? Let's, let, let's, it's way more simpler than that. 
if these ten horns represent the divisions of the Roman Empire, these four horns represent the division of, of the Grecian Empire, which means that they would, would they dwell in that area of the Grecian Empire, or would they be somewhere else on the other side of the world? You understand what I'm saying? In other words, we, we said earlier that these ten kingdoms are the kingdoms of Europe, and that the little horn comes up among them. He comes up among the ten kingdoms. Over here, the, 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 the horn and the beast is destroyed. The horn's broken. So this has to be the division of what we would consider to be the Greek Empire, right? So where was the Greek Empire? It came from what direction? And it went to what direction? And this kingdom over here that Persia had defeated represents the Medo-Persian and Babylonian Empire. Can I get an amen? What do we call that area? The Middle East. Can I get an amen? Okay. So, this area right here represents the Middle East, and it represents the, the, the Greek Empire, the territory that Alexander the Great had conquered, and these are the four divisions of that empire. Can I get an amen on that? Okay. So, what happens is, can this ever change? Can this ever change? It can't change, right? So the north, south, east, and west represent the divisions of the areas that would be divided up among Alexander's four generals. He had actually like eight main generals, but four of them became the strongest. Okay? Now, hold your finger here in, in Daniel chapter 9 and go with me to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Okay? Now, you guys told me earlier, it was unanimous, at least among this room, that when Daniel goes to the angel and says, hey, I want to know the truth of what all this means, we said he wants to know what the interpretation is, right? Okay. That was for Daniel chapter 7. But let's look now at Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the what? So brothers and sisters, when Daniel is asking for the truth in Daniel chapter 7, and the angel makes known the interpretation, and then the angel comes and says, I'm here to show you the truth. Is it going to be figurative or is it going to be literal? literal. It's going to be the truth. Yeah. Amen? And here's what he says. And now will I show, ye, show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, that his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside. And the king of the south shall be strong. So it goes into this story. So what happens is, here's this kingdom. We have the two names of the two powers, Persia and Greece, right? And that's what this story is about. Persia and Greece. But notice this. Notice this. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 8. Okay? Daniel chapter 8.
when, when this kingdom is broken up to the four winds in Daniel chapter 8, verse 8, look what it says in verse 9. Out of one of them. Now get this. Let's read it. We're, we're going to have to read verse 8 again. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them, out of one of what? Out of one of the four horns. And out of one of them came up a what? A little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and towards the what? Pleasant land. So let's look at this for a second. Out of one of these horns comes what? A little horn. So in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn comes up where? Among the ten. In Daniel chapter 7, the little horn comes up among the ten. In Daniel chapter 8, does the little horn come up among the four? It comes out of one of the horns. Right? And when it comes out of one of the horns, which direction does it go to? East and south and towards the pleasant land. So let's look at this. It goes to the east and to the south and towards the pleasant land, which is what? Jerusalem. Okay? Which direction is it coming out of? From the west, right? It's coming out of the west. And we know that geographically it has to come out of the west because it's the little horn. It comes so far out of the west, brothers and sisters, that where is it coming from? It's jumping from this story into this story. Do you understand what I'm saying? It comes up over here in Daniel chapter 7, but in Daniel chapter 8, it comes from this direction and it goes across the land. It goes over into the kingdom uh, that used to be ruled by Alexander the Great because in the year 168 BC, Rome defeated Greece in Macedonia. It came from the west, but the first part of the Greek empire that it took over was in Macedonia. And who came from Macedonia? History and prophecy agree. What famous person came from Macedonia, church? Alexander the Great. He came from Macedonia. And so when you, when you revert back to this horn, okay, that comes up and it comes from the west, that means the Bible is telling us that the place that Alexander came from is called the what? It's called the west. And since the first place that Rome conquers is Macedonia, that means that that little horn comes from the west. It comes up out of one of them. And history tells us, and history and prophecy agree, that that horn comes out of one of the horns, it comes out of the western horn, and what it does is that horn, it goes to the east and to the south and towards the pleasant land. It okay? Now, why am I telling you all this? Why are we talking about this? The pleasant land? The glorious land? Okay, yes. There's a great debate going on right now. A great debate on who the king of the north is. A great debate on who the king of the south is. And why I'm telling you these things is this. If we give license, in my opinion, 
to change what these horns represent, north, south, east, and west, of Alexander's empire. If we have license to move these horns to any geographic location anywhere in the world and say that this horn right here represents the USSR, and this horn right here, it represents Rome. Then what we're doing is we're taking the story that's being illustrated here and we're moving it to other... Ge we could say, well, it's the North. Well, maybe that's Santa Claus. Seriously. He's the king of the North Pole. I mean, you see what I'm saying? But it's rooted in this story that has to do with these wars that take place in the division of Alexander's empire. And, from the beginning. and the little horn, it doesn't come up among them, okay? It comes up out of one of them, out of one of the horns. It comes up out of the western horn. In fact, it's a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact that if you are, live in the east and you refer to the west, what are you referring to? You're referring to Latin society. You're, you're refer referring to Europe and the United States, right? Yeah. If you are from the West, you're from... You're, if, if somebody says you have Western ideology, you don't have Eastern ideology, you have Western. You think like a Westerner. Mm -hmm. You're talking about Europe. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. In this story right here, if we can move and just arbitrarily spiritualize these things, then we are telling the angel it's not the truth. And the angel is telling, I'm here to tell you the, the truth. The truth is that this is the division of the Grecian Empire. And from now on till the end of the world, it's going to be so. So, this area represents the division of Greece. This area here represents the division of Rome. And if we start moving around the horns, guess what's going to happen? It's going to change the interpretation of who the papacy is. Because if we say, well, these ten horns are the United Nations, then what, what can happen is, well, the little horn comes up among them, and the United Nations headquarters is in New York, so the little horn must be the United States of America, and all the heat is taken off the papacy, and Adventism just completely falls apart. If we spiritualize where these horns are located, there'd be no end to it. We say one year it's the Soviet Union, and the next year it's this, it's this, it's this. Now, if the Soviet Union, which no longer exists, but if Russia or any one of these other kingdoms was to come into the story and take over one of those horns, it would be the king of the north, or the king of the south, or the king of the east, or the king of the west. But right now, what's being taught is that if we go by this understanding right here, which was the understanding that the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially held for over 70 years, and it's in our books, like Bible Readings for the Home, 1888 version, and Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith from the 1870s all the way up into the 1920s. If you hold to this position, you're now being called a fanatic. A fanatic. I don't see any other way to do it. Because, in closing, go back with me to Daniel 11. In Daniel 11, and let's look at what's at stake here. The angel, the messenger, starts talking in verse 2 and says, And now I will show thee the truth. Okay? So, is the angel going to start out by showing him the truth, and then as he's telling him this whole story that ends in verse 45? Let's read verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palaces between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. 
And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even unto that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So what happens is from verse 2 all the way through verse 45, it's the truth. He never comes out and says, Daniel, I know I told you that I was going to tell you the truth. My bad. Now I'm going to, in verse 45, tell you a figurative spiritual understanding and never give you the interpretation. Do you understand what I'm saying? In verse 2, it's the truth. All the way to verse 45, to the story ends of who these kingdoms are that represent north, south, east, and west. It's a su succession of events. And all we have to do is connect the dots. How many people like playing the game connect the dots? All we have to do is start in verse 2. The angel says, I'm here to tell you the truth. He names the players, Persia and Greece. And all we have to do is look at the historical record and go, okay, that one falls. Okay, now this one, and now this one, and now this one, and successively follow them down, one kingdom after another, one kingdom rising and falling after another, until we finally get to verse 45, and then guess what? Whatever that last power is in that region that makes up Alexander's empire, whatever that last power is, that's the last power, and that's the end of the story. And when that kingdom comes to its end, Michael stands up, probation closes, and a time of trouble such as the world has never seen will be upon us. And that's pretty simple, isn't it? It doesn't take some special understanding of some mystical spiritual teaching that teaches us that south is in the north and north is in the west and everything else it's pretty plain and simple. And all those that say that, in my humble opinion, that the king of the south is in the north are bringing confusion. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? You're bringing confusion if you say the king of the north, the king of the south is in the north. Up is down, down is up, left is right. Right? Right? Let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we've been counseled by your prophet to take the word of God just as it reads. If there were no false teachers to mislead minds, to bring in something spiritual, when the angel tells us it's the truth, a great work would be done that would lead thousands into your fold. Events are now transpiring before us of a sufficient nature that we can know for certainty that probation is about to close. But your people, rather than giving the plain and straight truth of the events that are transpiring, are fighting among ourselves. Heaven help us, Lord. Forgive us for entering into these battles with each other, and let's just move forward with the straight testimony and the easy, plain message to give to the people a warning that probation's about to close and a time of trouble is right before us. Help us to do what is right in your sight in regard to these prophecies is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.